I want to turn myself off as well. OK, OK, uh, well, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor <coughs> Jeffrey A. Bell from uh, Southeastern Louisiana University, who is uh, the author of The Problem of Difference, Philosophy at the Age of Chaos, Deleuze's Hume, <laughs> Deleuze and Guattari's What is Philosophy, uh, and also um, most recently of all this uh, fantastic two volume work. Um, the first of which is an inquiry into analytic continental metaphysics and um, the second towards a critical existentialism. So do do pick up those two if, if you can. They're, they're, they're well worth reading. And uh, Jeff today is going to be presenting a paper entitled Pluralism is Monism. Pluralism equals Monism. The Principle of Sufficient Reason and the History of Modern Philosophy or Towards a Rethinking of Foucault and Putnam. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Henry. Um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, everyone, for, for logging on to, to hear my talk. Um, I had a hard time coming up with the title for this, this talk, and I had even written the paper, and it still had a hard time coming with the title. So I should explain that real quickly before I get started. The, the first half, the PSR and the history of modern philosophy, that, that sort of captures the, the general project that I'm working on right now. And the or towards the rethinking of Foucault and Putnam kind of gets towards what I'll be talking about today. But what I talk about today does fit into, at least as I envision it, the larger project of rethinking the role of the PSR and the history of modern uh, philosophy. So with that in mind, and, and this, this paper itself grew out of uh, like a paragraph in the Towards a Critical Existentialism book that I had that just came out um, where I talked about Foucault and Putnam, and I said, well, there's probably more there that I should explore. And so I'd always really wanted to kind of explore Foucault in a little more depth. So this paper is, or maybe a future chapter, is a result of, of, of thinking that through. So I look forward to the questions and feedback that you all have after I, after I go through this. OK. In the first of his 1955-56 winter lectures, published as The Principle of Reason, Heidegger notes how surprising it is that, quote, centuries were needed for the principle of reason to be stated as a principle. In fact, Heidegger adds that it took 2,300 years for the positing of this simple principle, the principle that states that nothing is without a reason, in what has come since Leibniz to be known as the principle of sufficient reason, or hereafter PSR, which Leibniz puts as, and there is a handout that was posted in the chat. It, it's no need to look at it if if you don't have it printed out already, but I have a page of all the quotes that I'll refer to. So the first quote on that handout is basically the PSR as Leibniz states it. And he states it in a few different places, but this is probably one of the more famous ones in the monadology. There can be found no fact that is true or existent or any true proposition without there being a sufficient reason for its being so and not otherwise. Why did it take so long for this principle to become explicitly formulated? One possibility Heidegger suggests is that the principle is too obvious to be stated, or as Heidegger puts it, our relation to the obvious is always dull and dumb. Despite being explicitly formulated, Heidegger claims, quote, we are still not awake enough to take in the oddity we would encounter if for once we began to give due note attention to the uncommonly long incubation period of the principle of reason. To begin to give due attention to the oddity of thinking through the implications of the PSR's long incubation period, I will begin in the first section by sketching Kant's critique of the PSR. In light of this critique, I will develop an argument for understanding the PSR as involving problematic ideas, extending work I have done elsewhere in, in the two volume work that just came out. With the PSR understood in this way, we can begin to rethink the nature of the debates concerning metaphysical realism in the history of modern philosophy and see more precisely how these debates play out in the analytic and continental traditions. This I will begin to do in the second section of this essay as I turn to discuss Foucault's text, The Archaeology of Knowledge, and show how Foucault both implicitly invokes the PSR and does so by drawing upon problematic ideas. By calling upon problematic ideas to make sense of Foucault's project, I will show how a metaphysics of multiplicity 
with multiplicity understood in Deleuze's sense, is central to Foucault's philosophy. To elaborate further upon the nature of this metaphysics, the third section will address Hilary Putnam's famous twin earth thought experiment and show how that argument also calls upon a metaphysics of multiplicities. Though Putnam, I argue, will in the end undermine his efforts by relying upon a subject object dualism. These discussions will begin to clarify the nature of the oddity that the PSR could at the same time be both obvious and problematic. And this will also begin to show how one can rethink several important issues in the history of modern philosophy. So onto the first section, PSR and problematic ideas. As is well known, Kant was critical of the PSR as formulated by Leibniz and then later put to work by Christian Wolff. According to Kant, the key demand of the PSR, namely that there is for every fact or proposition a sufficient reason why it is so and not otherwise, is a demand of reason that cannot be fully satisfied in experience. As finite human beings, Kant argues, it is important to distinguish between ideas that involve objects of possible experience and those that fall outside all possible experience. For in the case of the latter, we have, as Kant puts it, quote, a mere thought entity, a phantom of the brain. And such phantoms clearly cannot serve as a sufficient reason that explains why things are as they are and not otherwise. The world, for instance, or the infinite given whole of coexisting things, as Kant puts it, is one such phantom. The world may serve as a regulative ideal for finite human beings who are condemned to rely upon representations to mediate between the objects of possible experience and the world that is outside all possible experience, but it would be a mistake or an illusion, a transcendental illusion as Kant calls it, to assume this world provides the sufficient ground and reason for why things are as they are, why we have the representations we have. We can begin to rethink Kant's understanding of transcendental ideas, such as the idea of the world as an infinite given whole of coexisting things, by thinking of them as Kant does as problems. For Kant, a transcendental idea that involves an absolute whole of appearances is only an idea since we can never represent it in an image. It remains a problem to which there is no solution." That was a quote. Such an absolute whole can never become an object of possible experience. Stated as a classical skeptical argument, the problem consists of seeking the conditions for the conditioned, conditions with their own conditions that need to be sought, and so on, ad infinitum. If this leaves us with, quote, no starting point for argument, as Sextus Empiricus puts it, then there is no basis for an explanation. Since the PSR demands that for everything and for every truth, there is an explanation for why it is as it is and not otherwise, then the problematic nature of transcendental ideas leaves us without an ultimate explanation. And hence all for the worse for the PSR as Kant concludes. So briefly just summarizing Kant's argument against the PSR. The underlying assumption for both the skeptical challenge as well as Kant's claim that transcendental ideas are outside all possible experience is that an infinite regress renders adequate knowledge and or experience impossible. In both cases, the assumption is that our knowledge and experience must be grounded in something finite and determinate, such as an object of possible experience. In developing the notion of problematic ideas, I argue that the inevitability of the regress is not something to be overcome by either affirming in the manner of Spinoza an absolutely infinite reality that is irreducible to any finite determinate reality, nor is the regress to be accepted but then limited in the manner of Kant by an understanding that synthesizes representations in accordance with rules, namely the categories that allow for the possibility of experience. What I argue for instead is that problematic ideas are to be understood as both a condition irreducible to any determinate reality, to any object of possible experience, and they are the condition for the inevitable regress that determinate finite reality entails. Problematic ideas thus involve two contrasting tendencies. There is what I will call the de-differentiating tendency or the Spinozist monist tendency where problematic ideas are a determinate unity irreducible to the plurality of determinate realities from which they are inseparable. And there is a differentiating tendency or the Humean 
pluralist tendency, whereby the determinant gives rise to a regress as one pursues the condition of that which is determinately given and the condition of this condition and so on. In attempting to provide a reason for why things are as they are and not otherwise, therefore, or in appealing to the PSR, a consequence of problematic ideas is that what provides the reason for the determinately given is not itself determinately given, but is rather the condition for both the determinant and for the regress that undermines the attempt to explain the determinant. We can clarify the relationship between problematic ideas and the PSR by turning to Deleuze's concept of multiplicity, which Deleuze claims, and this is the second quote on the handout, replaces the one no less than the multiple and is the true substantive, substance itself. A multiplicity is neither to be confused with the realization of the Spinozist monist tendency to a determinate totality, nor with the realization of the Humean pluralist tendency toward a regress of the determinate. Since Deleuze claims that, quote, ideas are multiplicities, the task for philosophy therefore involves, quote, the art of multiplicities, the art of grasping the idea and the problems they incarnate in things, and of grasping things as incarnations, as cases of solution for the problems of ideas, end quote. Then for Deleuze, the search for the PSR, or a consequence of this, is for Deleuze that the search for the PSR of things entails the art of discerning the problematic ideas inseparable from things. And one is to do this in such a way that, or the art of multiplicities entails, neither reducing things to a determinate totality nor launching upon a regress. We can now make sense of Deleuze's claim that, problem, quote, problematic ideas are precisely the ultimate elements of nature for they are the PSR of the determinate nature of things themselves. As we will see, thinking of the PSR as problematic ideas clarifies the projects of philosophers in both the analytic and continental traditions. More to the point, I will show how the projects of both Michel Foucault and Hilary Putnam can be read as an attempt to avoid a monism that denies reality to a plurality of distinct objects, the Spinozist tendency, and a pluralism of determinate entities that denies a totality that is irreducible to any multiplicity of distinct objects, the Humean tendency. Both Foucault and Putnam, therefore, are gesturing towards a metaphysics of multiplicity that entails understanding the PSR as problematic ideas. So under the Foucault section. Reflecting upon three books he wrote in the 1960s, Madness and Civilization, 1961, Birth of the Clinic, 1963, and The Order of Things, 1966, Foucault admits his attempts to carry out a form of intellectual history resulted in an imperfect sketch where, quote, the tasks of this project were outlined in a rather disordered way, and their general articulation was never clearly defined, end quote. In The Archaeology of Knowledge from 1971, Foucault sets out to clarify what he was trying to do in these histories. And early on, it is clear that what Foucault is not doing is a history of madness, medicine, political economy, etc., where these subjects are taken to be pre-existent realities simply waiting to be revealed by Foucault's historic, historical narrative. As Foucault puts it, his histories did not attempt a, quote, total description that draws all phenomena around a single center, a principle, a meaning, a spirit, a worldview, an overall shape, end quote. What he sought instead was a general history that, quote, would deploy the space of a dispersion, end quote, a method of analysis purged of all anthropologism, meaning a method that does not predetermine the shape or manner the space of a dispersion comes to acquire. What this entails for Foucault is that, quote, we must question those ready-made syntheses, those groupings that we normally accept before any examination. The ready-made syntheses such as tradition, influence, and development and evolution that leads us to assume that through our analyses, we will be able to, quote, discover already at work in each beginning, a principle of coherence and the outline of a future unity, end quote. In other words, Rather than the search for an original foundation that would make rationality the telos of mankind, for instance, 
Foucault's aim, as he puts it, quote, is to uncover the principles and consequences of an autochthonous transformation that is taking place in the field of historical knowledge, end quote. Stated differently, the task is to understand how the space of a dispersion becomes a unity with characteristic regularities and how it does so without presupposing the unity it becomes. We can gain a better sense of Foucault's project and the descriptive terms he uses if we see it as an attempt to track the relations and encounters that occur within a space of a dispersion. Once we, be, once we move beyond the presupposed unities that are often taken to prefigure the historical events being described, then, Foucault, then for Foucault, quote, an entire field is set free. This field is made up of the totality of all effective statements, whether spoken or written, in their dispersion as events and in the occurrence that is proper to them, end quote. The space of a dispersion, therefore, is a field of effective statements, but not all statements are effective statements, which leads to the question as to how, where, and in what circumstances a statement becomes effective. By setting forth Foucault's project as one that works with problematic ideas as the PSR, we can begin to address this question by seeing that Foucault's task consists of discerning the problematic ideas inseparable from effective statements. Ideas that are the PSR for the autochthonous self-organization of the statements that come to be identified with the unities that are frequently assumed to pre-exist and guide the processes that give rise to effective statements. Before clarifying the nature of effective statements, let us turn first to discuss the nature of statements. For Foucault, it is clear what statements are not. They are not propositions, sentences, or speech acts. And this is because, Foucault, Foucault argues, quote, one finds statements lacking in legitimate propositional structure, one finds statements where one cannot recognize a sentence, and one finds more statements than one can isolate in speech acts. And Foucault had gone through several examples where there was a statement and didn't fit into those different descriptors. For something to be a statement then, it is not a matter of determining the relations between the author and what he says or wanted to say or said without wanting to, but more importantly for Foucault, it is a matter of quote, determining what position can and must be occupied by any individual if he is to be the subject of a statement, end quote. For example, if I write the sentence, my friend recently realized that they are on the autism spectrum with Asperger's syndrome, then this sentence becomes a statement according to Foucault when it becomes possible for someone, such as my friend, to become a subject that one can refer to in speech or writing or in propositions, sentences, and speech acts, whereby this person may legitimately be taken to be a person with Asperger's syndrome. But what if we say that Ludwig Wittgenstein was also one who had Asperger's, as is widely assumed today? Is this a statement? In Wittgenstein's day, it was not possible for him or anyone else to self-identify as being Asperger's, for this was not a position one could occupy at that time. Although it is a legitimate statement that can be made today about Wittgenstein, it was not in the 1950s. On the question as to whether it is true or not that Wittgenstein had Asperger's and whether the syndrome simply hadn't been discovered yet, Foucault is ambivalent. Foucault does reject a metaphysical realism that claims there is a reality to Asperger's and other conditions that simply await being identified and named. This follows straightforwardly from Foucault's rejection, as we saw earlier, of a predetermining unity or reality that is the telos that guides and accounts for the successes of our scientific and historical inquiries. Foucault is explicit on this point, noting that, quote, it would certainly be a mistake to try to discover what could have been said of madness at a particular time by interrogating the being of madness itself, its secret content, its silent self-enclosed truth, end quote. On the other hand, and thus the ambivalence, Foucault allows that, quote, his archeology span does not deny the possibility of new statements in correlation with external events. And he even admits that in the 19th century, diseases that are perhaps as old as the world, like tuberculosis, were at last isolated and named. If we can say, as has been said, that an ancient Egyptian di died of tuberculosis, 
then why can we not say that Wittgenstein had Asperger's? We can. But what is important here for, for Foucault is that this is the case for statements made today. And yet the task of archaeology, according to Foucault, quote, is to show how on what is to show on what condition a correlation with external events can exist between them, statements and external events, and what precisely it consists of. What are its limits, its form, its code, its law of possibility, end quote. That is, in what circumstances and under whose authority can one speak and issue a statement, a statement that correlates a modern and contemporary medical diagnosis, for instance, to a time and place when that was not possible, to an ancient Egyptian who died of tuberculosis, or to Wittgenstein and his Asperger's, etc. It is at this point where Foucault's historical analyses enter the heavy weeds of describing the many interactions, statements, institutions, power differentials, and relationships that come to make up the space of a dispersion, where statements come to be made and encounter one another. It is in this context where statements about things in the present or past, such as tuberculosis, become a possibility. As Foucault puts it, and this is the fifth quote, the object such as tuberculosis, that is the cock bacillus, does not await in limbo the order that will free it and enable it to become embodied in a visible and prolix objectivity. It does not pre-exist itself. It exists, Foucault adds, under the positive conditions of a complex group of relations, end quote. Inseparable from the objects, for example, tuberculosis, and subjects, for example, a person with Asperger's, is a complex mesh of relations and practices. And the task of archaeology, as Foucault understands it, is to draw our attention to these complexities. In contrast to a traditional history of ideas that sets out to tie all the elements, practices, and relations together by appealing to the behind the scenes guidance of an object waiting to be discovered, Foucault's archaeological approach, quote, seeks rather to untie all those knots that historians have patiently tied. It increases differences, blurs the lines of communication, and tries to make it more difficult to pass from one thing to another, end quote. Such as showing, for example, how the, quoting Foucault, the physiocratic analysis of production foreshadowed that of Ricardo. I'll return to that example in a few minutes. We can now see how Foucault's archaeology entails, in important respects, an art of multiplicities. As we saw earlier, the art of multiplicities entails grasping the idea and the problems they incarnate in things, and of grasping things as incarnations, as cases of solution for the problems of ideas. Understood in this way, when one follows Foucault's archaeological method and unties all those knots that historians have patiently tied, one can discern the multiplicities that are incarnated in statements such as Wittgenstein had Asperger's. As Foucault puts this, the referential of the statement is not the object, truth value, or something done by a speech act, but rather it is, quote, the place, the condition, the field of emergence, the authority to differentiate between individuals or objects, states of things, and relations that are brought into play by the statement itself, end quote. In other words, when a statement accomplishes something, when it is an effective statement, such as one that diagnoses and identifies a person as having a certain medical condition, then what makes such a statement effective is precisely the complex group of statements and discursive practices that are incarnated in an effective statement. Foucault is quite clear that, quote, a statement always belongs to a series or a whole, always plays a role among other statements, deriving support from them and distinguishing itself from them. It is always part of a network of statements, end quote. For Foucault, therefore, a statement can be understood to be a problematic idea or the PSR for effective statements. And as such, there is the differentiating Humean tendency to ever more statements, to the complex web of relations and phenomena Foucault patiently and meticulously describes. Such descriptions involve a regress of relations Foucault himself appears to recognize when he claims that, quote, a statement is always an event that neither the language nor the meaning 
can quite exhaust. Much as the solutions that incarnate problems do not exhaust the problems or problematic ideas that made the solutions possible, so too the established meanings and relations that statements make possible do not exhaust the nature of statements. In, a in addition to the differentiating tendency of statements as problematic ideas, there is also the de-differentiating Spinozist tendency that leads one to identify an established meaning or relation as one that is irreducible to and not to be confused with the many related statements and discursive practices that made this established meaning and relation possible. Foucault will re frequently refer to this unity that is inseparable from and irreducible to the many statements and practices being analyzed and described as episteme, or on this below. Foucault's efforts to chart the formation of our discursive practices and effective statements thus exemplifies the dual pluralist monist tendencies of problematic ideas. An important consequence of Foucault's archaeological method, or his use of the art of multiplicities, is that one of the first and most important knots to be untied is that of words and things. And the title of order of things was in French was mauvais choses, so words and things. So where words are taken to contain an established sense with a referent that refers to an object, thing, or identifiable state of affairs such as someone being correctly identified as having Asperger's. What interests Foucault is precisely the normative force that comes to be associated with the relations between words and things. And this force, he finds, comes about through a series of a dynamic processes and practices. As Foucault puts it, quote, in analyzing discourses themselves, one sees the loosening of the embrace, apparently so tight, of words and things and the emergence of a group of rules proper to discursive practice." End quote. In other words, rather than assume that there are things that pre-exist their naming, a diagnosable condition that awaits the researcher to identify and name it, Foucault argues that there is a complex set of practices and rules, a multiplicity or problematic idea that allows for the very emergence of the things that come to be named and identified. And it is the formation of these rules, or what Foucault calls a discursive formation, that is inseparable from the normative force that comes to be associated with correctly identifying something. As Foucault summarizes the process at work, he claims, this is the eighth quote, by system of formation, then, I mean a complex group of relations that function as a rule. It lays down what must be related in a particular discursive practice, for such and such an enunciation to be made, for such and such a concept to be used, for such and such a strategy to be organized. To define a system of formation in its specific individuality is therefore to characterize a discourse or group of statements by the regularity of a practice." End quote. Moreover, the dynamics that drive this process of formation are not, for Foucault, some fundamental life force, an elan vital, so to speak but rather a multiplicity of interacting practices and processes. Foucault is forthright on this point, noting that, quote, what is discovered by the analysis of formations is not the bubbling source of life itself, life in an as yet uncaptured state. It is an immense density of systematicities, a tight group of multiple relations, end quote. These discursive formations exemplify both the regularities that emerge through the dynamics of differentiating and identifying further relations and phenomena, while at the same time abstracting or de-differentiating from this phenomena, their unities, regularities, and rules. It is for this reason that a statement, according to Foucault, quote, belongs to a discursive formation as a sentence belongs to a text and a proposition to a deductive whole. But whereas the regularity of a sentence is defined by the laws of a language and that of a proposition by the laws of logic, the regularity of statements is defined by the discursive formation itself." End quote. To clarify this last point, let us return to Foucault's claim that his archaeological method sets out to discern the complexities inseparable from the established relations between words and things refusing in the process to see the history of ideas as the inevitable march and progress of inquiry 
towards the realization of the things that pre-exist their being named. For example, and returning to an earlier example, rather than seeing the physiocratic analysis of production as an early tentative step that led to the developments that Ricardo would make, David Ricardo, Foucault's archeological approach describes the contingencies, strategies, and power relations that both made Ricardo's statements possible and yet are statements that are not the predetermined telos the physiocrats only saw dimly. For Foucault and the classical analysis of wealth is not to be saddled with, quote, the ulterior unity of a political economy in the, in the tentative process of constituting itself. But rather, the analysis he carries out involves describing a system of rules and practices that accounts for and provides the reasons and justifications for the statements made. In the classical analysis of wealth, for instance, the numerous debates among the Booleanists, those in favor of gold, and the anti-Booleanists, those not, uh, and the concepts and distinctions that were made brought to bear in these debates were not a loosely related collection of claims waiting the full blooming of Ricardo's political economy that's, that will provide the unity they lacked. Rather, Foucault argues that these debates had their own logic, their own imminent unity, what he calls the classical episteme. And it is, quote, the episteme that made general grammar, natural history, and the science of wealth possible, end quote. This episteme came to an end, Foucault argues, with the limits of representation, or, quote, the decline of representation and the emancipation of language, of the living being, and of need with regard to representation, end quote. The physiocrats, for example, came to, view, came to the view that wealth is found in the products of the land and in virtue of the laborer's co-author, that is God, and the land that God gave to all in common. This land can in turn be represented by the gold that itself has value, but for gold to represent the value produced from the land, however, there must first be an excess produced off the land. And for the physiocrats, there can be no wealth, Foucault notes, unless the fruits on my tree are sufficiently numerous to exceed my appetite. Influenced by the medical theories of William Harvey, physiocrats such as Francois Cadenet argued that it was this surplus that needed to circulate well through a society, much as the blood needed to circulate through the body, as Harvey had argued, to maintain the health and wealth of the society. It is in virtue of the fact that nature is endowed with endless fecundity, as Foucault puts it, that the wealth of the land can circulate through an economy and be represented by the monetary value of gold coin. In the classical episteme, therefore, which includes Kant, according to Foucault, the representations and signs of wealth, namely gold coin, are made possible because the representations mediate between an infinite reality a divine co-author's gift of an endlessly fecund nature and our finite determinate needs. It is this episteme that comes to an end in the late 18th and early 19th century. And Foucault's early books sought to chart the breaks and disruptions that explain this shift from the physiocrats to the political economy of Ricardo, for instance. And he attempts to do so without overlaying this process with a teleological unity whereby the classical episteme gives way through a progression towards the real to a better, more accurate, modern episteme. If we return to our earlier discussion of Kant's critique of the PSR, we can begin to take stock of Foucault's project. As we have seen, for Foucault, the archeological approach to history is one that does not presuppose the unity that organizes the facts and events being studied. A unity nonetheless emerges for Foucault, an episteme, by which he means, quote, the total set of relations that unite at a given period, the discursive practices that give rise to epistemological figures, sciences, and possibly formalized systems, end quote. Such unities, however, are inseparable from the discursive practices and statements themselves, although they are not to be confused with them. As Foucault states it, quote, the statement is neither visible nor hidden, end quote. What Foucault's project is encountering, I would argue, is problematic ideas as the PSR for the determinate statements and the established relations that come to take hold between words and things. 
Understood in this way, problematic ideas as multiplicities have both a de-differentiating Spinozist tendency towards a unity or one, a tendency towards an episteme that is not to be confused with the many statements, facts, and strategic possibilities that episteme makes possible. And there is the differentiating Humean tendency towards the many, towards the discrete and determinate statements, possibilities, and facts that incarnate the problematic idea. These de-differentiating tendencies are tendencies, and as such, neither the episteme nor the facts are locked into a permanent state, but are always provisional, subject to contingencies. Foucault notes this point as well when he claims that, quote, the episteme is not a motionless figure that appeared one day with the mission of effacing all, all that preceded it. It is a constantly moving set of articulations, shifts, and coincidences that are established only to give rise to others, end quote. These shifts and moving set of articulations, moreover, feed back onto the tendencies of the episteme, transforming its rules, its regularities, and becoming, without being predetermined to do so, another episteme with other tendencies. As Foucault summarizes his project towards the end of the archaeology of knowledge, he states that, and this is quote number 10, uh, my aim was to analyze this history in the discontinuity that no teleology would reduce in advance, to map it in a dispersion that no pre-established horizon would embrace, to allow it to be deployed in an anonymity on which no transcendental condition would impose the form of the subject, to open it up to a temporality that would not promise the return of any dawn, end quote. As with the relationship of problems to solutions, as Deleuze understands it, problems do not predetermine their solutions, or the solution is not imminent to the problem, waiting to be actualized. There is no set of solutions that exhausts the nature of the problem, no horizon of possibilities that totalizes that which problematic ideas ground. The problems do not impose the same form on each and every solution, and the solutions themselves feed back under the problems, changing their nature and the nature of the solutions, staving off the return of the same dawn, the same new beginning. In Foucault's summary of his project, therefore, we can now see that he was attempting, as was his contemporary Deleuze, to develop and practice the art of multiplicities. To show that Foucault was not alone, and to highlight the broad wake left behind by the PSR and Kant's initial efforts to respond to it, we can turn briefly to the work of Hilary Putnam. So under the Putnam section. In his famous twin error thought experiment, Hilary Putnam echoes Foucault's own conclusions. Putnam, like Foucault, challenges the metaphysical realist's assumption that there is an object or natural kind substance, for example, water, that pre-exists it's being named and identified. The subsequent question for Putnam, as it was for Foucault, is how and in what circumstances we can be said to correctly name something as water. Here too, as we will see, Putnam largely echoes Foucault's own approach, an approach Putnam calls internal realism, though there are some important illuminating differences between Putnam and Foucault. As the thought experiment proceeds, twin earth is very much like earth, nearly identical in fact, with one unique exception, namely the liquid the inhabitants of twin earth call water, a liquid indistinguishable from water at normal temperatures and pressures. It tastes like water and it quenches thirst like water and it fills their lakes, seas and rivers is not H2O, but a different liquid whose chemical formula is very long and complicated. And so Putnam abbreviates it simply as XYZ. For Putnam, this example helps to disambiguate the relations between meaning, psychological states, and that which is meant when one says this is water. Actually, I have a little bit of water right now. Ah, good water. Um, for travelers from Earth to Twin Earth and vice versa, all would likely be in the same state of mind as the inhabitants of the planet they visit except for those with the expertise and skills to determine that XYZ is not water, for it is not H2O. For Putnam, however, even though people from Twin Earth and Earth are each in the same psychological state when in the presence of what they call water, this does not mean they are in the presence of water. In fact, inhabitants of Twin Earth, Putnam argues, are not in the presence of water. 
where water is that which is indexically tied to what is referred to on Earth in a move often equated with Kripke's theory of rigid, rigid designators. So we in Earth call water water, and it's H2O, so it's always going to be H2O by sort of Kripke's theory of rigid designation. Moreover, if we were to go back in time to 1750, and this is, I think, the key point for Putnam, uh, prior to the time when water was known to be H2O, then even though everyone would be in the same psychological state, no one would know that there was a difference between H2O and XYZ, okay? Everyone would be in the same psychological state. They would still not mean the same thing by water, according to Putnam. For in the case of Twinner, it is not water that is meant or referred to, but XYZ. The lesson Putnam draws, quote, cut the pie any way you like, meanings just ain't in the head, end quote. Putnam draws two important conclusions from his thought experiment regarding the meaning of meaning. And that's actually the name of the essay that uh, uh, Twin Earth Experiment is, is in. The first challenge is the unquestioned assumption, or what he thought was an unquestioned assumption, that knowing the meaning of a term is just a matter of being in a certain psychological state. We have now seen how Putnam's Twin Earth thought experiment led to the conclusion that the meaning of is water is not to be identified with a psychological state, since the same state could mean two different things, H2O or XYZ. The second conclusion concerns the notion that the meaning of a term determines its extension. Putnam will keep this assumption, but he will argue that the meaning determines extension, quote, by construction, so to speak. What Putnam means by construction here is that extension is no longer determined by meaning as grasped by an individual, but it is, quote, the social linguistic state of the collective linguistic body to which the speaker belongs that fixes the extension, end quote. This collective linguistic body entails a division of labor where some have the skills and conceptual repertoire to differentiate H2O from XYZ. The most simply see and say water and mean it. It is the theory of experts, a theory Putnam believes involves tracking the nature of reality that determines and fixes extension. This gets to the heart of Putnam's internal realism, for the predicate is water does determine the extension of something real, namely H2O, and this extension is not determined solely by social, social or cultural factors, but also by a theory that seeks to represent reality. If Archimedes were to refer to a substance X as gold, a substance we now know is not gold, Putnam claims that Archimedes is not correctly fixing the extension of X as gold, even if he, Archimedes, were using the best theories of his day. Who is to say Archimedes is wrong? One may wonder. Putnam has a ready answer, quote, we are using the best theory available today, end quote. According to Putnam's internal realism, therefore, it is an illusion to think of reality as the metaphysical realist does, as that which is independent of and distinct from the theories humans use and create to represent this reality. There are simply the many efforts to account for, track, and represent phenomena by our theories. And the notion of a reality distinct from these theories is an effect of and an abstraction from these many efforts. Bringing Foucault back in, we can see where Foucault and Putnam agree, but also where they part ways. For Putnam, like Foucault, what makes our current theories regarding the nature of gold correct, whereas Archimedes is not, is the complex inter interaction of practices, descriptions, and theories, or the differentiating Humean tendency, where explanations become increasingly differentiated. And then there is the abstract substance or natural kind, gold, water, etc., that following the de-differentiating Spinozist tendency is inseparable from but irreducible to the many practices, descriptions, and theories used by the community of scientists to identify gold. A consequence of the community coming to identify gold, water, etc., and in accordance with the theories and strategies deemed to be the best at the time, is that the substance Archimedes identified as gold becomes something else, and thus Archimedes was wrong to call it gold. And the same is true regarding our earlier examples of tuberculosis and Asperger's. For Putnam, we need no standard outside the standards used by the scientists of the time to justify one's judgment regarding what is not is or is not water 
gold, Asperger's, etc. Nor is this judgment justified by the reality of the substance itself, independent of any theory or means of describing the substance, a position um, Putnam calls incoherent. As Putnam will later describe his internal realism, what he admits, quote, he should have called pragmatic realism, it is, quote, at bottom, just the insistence that realism is not incompatible with conceptual relativity. One can be both a realist and a conceptual relativist, end quote. Stated in Foucault's terms, the discursive formations of an episteme allow for the possibility that certain statements can be made. And what this entails, as we have seen, is a whole host of regularities and rules associated with an array of discursive practices. From the tools and conceptual repertoire available to describe and predict phenomena to the set of power relations that determine who has authority to speak or issue statements. And these all combine to establish the normative guidelines for the statements we make about what is the case. The combination of all these factors accounts for why Foucault admits that, quote, one cannot speak of anything at any time. It is not easy to say something new, end quote. For if it falls outside the current norms, regularities, and rules, then it is difficult to make any statements except for those that others would recognize as legitimate. Foucault, however, like Putnam, is not denying that there is a reality. To the contrary, and this is the point I want to stress, reality simply is problematic ideas, the ultimate elements of nature, as Deleuze put it. And as the PSR, they make it possible for statements to assert something about reality. This reality, moreover, involves both the tendency for statements to be related in a process of ongoing differentiation to the many facts and phenomena involved, and the de-differentiating tendency towards an abstract generality or totality that is not to be confused with or reduced to these differentiated details. On the reading proposed here, therefore, Foucault's project provides a justification for and further clarification of Putnam's internal realism. Putnam, however, does not take the path that can be seen to embrace problematic ideas as the PSR, but relies instead on a problematic dualism. As John McDowell has argued, the arguments that led Putnam to conclude that meanings just ain't in the head presuppose a distinction between a representational content in the head or mind and what it is that is being interpreted by way of this representational content. In the Twin Earth example, what leads to the conclusion that meanings are not in the head is the fact that a person on earth and a person on twin earth could both be in the same mental state with the same representational content, and yet this would not determine the same extension. For the extension is H2O for one and XYZ for the other. The same applies for Putnam as we saw. Even in 1750, when there was no community of scientific experts able to differentiate between H2O and XYZ. Even then, the same psychological states did not pick out and determine the same extension. And thus Putnam's conclusion that meanings just ain't in the head. For McDowell, this is where the problems begin for Putnam. The problem as McDowell sees it is in determining what relates, if anything, the psychological state of grasping and understanding the meaning of a word and the extension of the word. Stated differently, what determines whether we have used the word correctly? If the grasp of a meaning is a psychological state that does not determine the extension of this meaning, as Putnam argues, then the intrinsic nature of a psychological state functions much like a signpost, McDowell argues, and it does not by itself tell you how to relate the signpost to that which is being represented, the extension. What's it a sign for? As McDowell puts it, quote, what counts as following the signpost and what does not is not an inscribed board fixed to a post considered in itself, but such an object under a certain interpretation, such an object interpreted as a signpost pointing the way to a certain destination, end quote. In other words, since a psychological state does not determine on its own how it is related to its extension, then what does? For McDowell, it is a certain interpretation of the state, of the signpost. This interpretation, however, is an act of mind, another psychological state or signpost with representational content that does not determine by itself its relation to what is being interpreted, its extension. And thus we need another interpretation by another act of mind and so on ad infinitum. 
To end the regress, McDowell argues, we need to move beyond thinking of meaning in terms of psychological states, or we need to follow through, as I would put it, on the Foucaultian promise of Putnam's argument and recognize that not only are meanings not in the head, but neither are mental states. Stating McDowell's arguments in the terms we have used here, although Putnam does embrace both realism and conceptual relativity, he endorses the notion of, or, or he endorses the notion of problematic ideas, as I have argued for it here. He does not extend this to the sense and reference distinction. McDowell resolves the problems he sees in Putnam by arguing that all is conceptual, although this leads to a problem of its own, as I've, I've discussed elsewhere. On the approach offered here, and I'm wrapping up here now, if we accept the PSR as problematic ideas, then both sense as an intention and meaning and reference as extension are made possible by problematic ideas. Unlike Putnam, therefore, the distinction between sense and its extension is not presupposed, even if it is an extension determined by the construction of social linguistic community of experts. And as a result, the regress this gives rise to, as McDowell showed, does not occur. Rather, problematic ideas are the PSR that provide the grounds for the determinate distinctions between sense and reference mind and world, etc. In short, the best way to avoid the problematic dualisms of sense and reference, the problems that infected Putnam's work, um, is to embrace problematic ideas as the PSR for the determinant itself. Such an embrace of problematic ideas involves, as I have argued for here, a metaphysics of multiplicity that involves both a pluralist Humean tendency and a Spinozist monist tendency. With this metaphysics, we can be said to attain, as Deleuze and Guattari put it in A Thousand Plateaus, the magic formula we all seek, pluralism equals monism. With this magic formula in hand, we are able to begin, as I hope I have shown today, to rethink debates across both the analytic and continental traditions. Thank you.